And uh, welcome to the family church. What? Welcome to the family church. I have some things I want to let you know about. First off is um, we have a meeting coming up on Wednesday, October 28th at 6 p.m. It's our annual charge conference, and we'll be doing it by Zoom. So if you want to participate, um, be sure you, and you don't get an email announcement for one reason or another. Maybe you're not on the email list or you don't usually check your email. Uh, let me know so that we can get you an invite for Zoom uh, or at least give you the number and you can call in and participate by phone. It'll be a shortened meeting. It won't contain all the things we usually do in a charge conference, uh, but we do need your support to help us get those things taken care of. Also, if you haven't already received a bag, you'll be having a bag dropped off at your home soon. And this contains some supplies for a whole bunch of things coming up over the next couple of months. Um, there will be a pledge card in there and materials for our stewardship drive. There will be a little gift. Um, there will be a candle for Christmas Eve. Uh, materials for all kinds of things coming up, some craft projects. Um, so we'll be dropping those off at your home. If you participate with us online and you'd like us to send you the materials, uh, ship them to you or get them to you some other way, please send me an email or a Facebook message and we'll make arrangements so that you can participate from areas outside the Fox Cities. Also coming up uh, is All Saints Day. This is a day when we remember people that we have lost in our lives. And um, All Saints Day is November 1st, which happens to fall on a Sunday this year. So we hope that you'll be thinking about that. And if you have somebody that you want us to mention during our online worship, please send me an email with the person's name and a little information about who they are to you. Um, we don't have to use last names uh, because we're doing it online. We try to just use first names, um, but please send me the information and we will say that person's name and we will be doing a little uh, ceremony of lighting candles and you can light candles at home yourself for that person as you watch worship uh, whenever you watch it that week. Uh, but that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. Also coming up uh, to put on your calendar is Thursday, November 12th. Thursday, November 12th, we are going to be doing uh, worship by Zoom, and we will be recording it and using that as the worship that people access on Sunday. So if you can participate live, um, it'll be an opportunity to participate in worship, to interact a little bit, to see people's faces, and to digitally turn in your pledge card on Thursday, November 12th uh, in the evening. And... Um, if you can't make it then, that's all right. You can watch worship online during the week as you usually would and participate in that way. Uh, finally, the last announcement I have is that we will need volunteers for lighting the Advent candles. Uh, in order to accomplish this, we're going to uh, have you come in to the church and we'll have the Advent wreath set up. And uh, you can even be there with just yourself or whoever you're lighting the candles with and do the, the readings that you're provided. Um, but we're going to have you record it. And then uh, we're going to have all those recorded ahead of time so we can add them into the, each week of worship during Advent. So if you, uh, you and your family or somebody you're sheltering with or whatever, however you want to do it, if you want to record um, a short reading and the lighting of one week's worth of the Advent candle, please let me know so that I can get it set up for you in the next couple of weeks so that it's ready to go when Advent comes. I want to thank you for being here and I want to take just a minute and share some prayers that I've heard uh, from people. Um, prayers for people who are dealing with COVID. Uh, Norm has a positive test and I know some other people in our congregation who have been uh, quarantined because they were exposed to somebody who has COVID. Uh, our healthcare workers who are uh, once again uh, getting tested uh, really pushed with a lot of work and a lot of stress as they deal with all the people who are uh, who have the illness or who are needing healthcare services for other reasons in a time when everything is stretched a bit. 
prayers for our leaders and for scientists and doctors who are working to find ways for us to better deal with this crisis. Prayers for people who continue to struggle with the effects of the natural disasters. Uh, I have one cousin who was in the path of this past hurricane and it's the second time that he's been, he and his family have been affected uh, having lost a home uh, not too long ago. Prayers for people who are living in situations that are much tougher than ours. I keep reminding myself that, yeah, there's some stress and some inconvenience for me, uh, but for people who are living in serious poverty or in places in the world where they're in extreme physical danger, people who suffer from oppression or discrimination because of the color of their skin, or because of who they love, or just because of where they were born. Um, we pray for them and pray that God's love might reach them and pray that God's justice might reign on earth. I invite you to take all these things and the prayers that are on your hearts and make time this week to pray, to be in prayer not just when we're in worship together, to be in prayer for those around you and for your own families. Let's pray together right now. God, we thank you for a church family. We thank you for the opportunity to be together, to know that we are supporting one another. God, we thank you for your vision, for a path to follow, for giving us a mission, for your justice and for your love. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. On my way to the province of Macedonia, I advise you to stay in Ephesus. Well, I haven't changed my mind. Stay right there on top of things so that the teaching stays on track. Apparently, some people have been introducing fantasy stories and fanciful family trees that digress into silliness instead of pulling the people back into the center deepening faith and obedience. The whole point of what we're urging is simply love. Love uncontaminated by self-interest and counterfeit faith, a life open to God. Those who fail to keep to this point soon wander off into cul-de-sacs of gossip. They set themselves up as experts on religious issues, but haven't the remotest idea of what they're holding forth with such imposing eloquence. It's true that moral guidance and counsel need to be given, but the way you say it and to whom you say it are as important as what you say. It's obvious, isn't it, that the law code isn't primarily for people who live responsibly, but for the irresponsible, who defy all authority, riding roughshod over God, life, sex, truth, whatever. They are contemptuous of this great message I've been put in charge of by this great God. Hey, Bibi, I'm glad I ran into you. Have I got a deal for you. Okay, see you, bye. No, wait. You gotta hear about this. I wanna share this very special opportunity with a limited number of only my closest friends. Let me guess. A melted ice cream cone for the price of two. No, much better. Some sort of Tom Sawyer scheme where I end up paying you to do your homework? No, I already have a kid doing that for me. Let me guess. The water in the fountain at the park is too cold for you to climb into and collect all the coins, so you want me to do it for you? Nope. I got a wetsuit for Christmas last year. And there's a coin shortage, so if you take them to the right bank, you get a bonus. No, BB, I have solved the problem of Halloween during a pandemic. Really? Everyone thinks trick-or-treating is too germy, so they don't want us going house to house this year. Everyone knows I rely on Halloween to stock up on candy for the year. Yeah, I remember. Last year you got nine trash bags full of candy. I have worked for years on a system where I'm able to trick-or-treat with perfect efficiency. I hit Appleton, Nina, Little Shoot, Wrightstown twice, and Menasha. Wrightstown twice? Their trick-or-treat time is four hours long. Plus, that's where the owner of Saruji's Chocolate lives. I do his house six times. Doesn't he notice you coming back? Six costumes, and an outrageous French accent, don't you know? So, what are you going to do this year? Well, Bibi, I'm glad you asked. Since we can't trick-or-treat, 
I'm launching the Reese's Rhombus of Riches. Everyone who joins me will be rich with candy. Well, I do like candy. You don't say. Me too. Here's how it works. You collect candy. You can convince your parents to buy it for you, or you can just go out and buy some for yourself. For the first part, you want to focus on the 100 grand bar, Snickers, and Airheads. Well, you are what you eat. Once you have a grocery bag full of candy, you bring it to me. Then you find three more people and recruit them to bring a grocery bag of candy. Now you have three grocery bags of candy. You get out all the Snickers, Airheads, and basically any full-size candy bars and bring those to me, you get to keep the rest. Plus, I give you all the circus peanuts, candy corn, and peanut butter taffy that the other members give me. So, I have to buy you a lot of candy, con three people into buying you more candy, and I get all the leftover junk? But think of how wealthy you'll be, and your recruits will each recruit three more people, and you'll be collecting candy from them, too. Billy! Sounds like a pyramid scheme. It's not a pyramid scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme, but with candy, so it's legal. Legal? Doubtful. Moral? Definitely not. The Reese's Rhombus of Riches has a lot going for it. Well, it has a catchy name. At least you're alliterative. I can read just fine. And what if I told you that I had the approval of God? Oh, really? God spoke to you about candy? No, but the first recruit I got was the pastor's kid. Does the pastor know? He bought the candy. Billy! Well, technically, he bought it for a Halloween party at church that's canceled, so... So, you and the pastor's kid stole candy from the church to start your scam. And now, you're trying to con me out of my allowance. Con is such a harsh word, BB. I prefer swindle. And we're not trying to take your allowance. We're just asking you to contribute one grocery bag of candy to receive three. And then you'll have a steady stream of candy from your recruits' recruits. Plus, whatever you can squeeze out of kids smaller than you. So now you're adding mugging on top of racketeering? There's no tennis. And you don't hit kids to get their candy. That's me. But if you're bigger than them, and they're just naturally scared enough to feel they owe you something... I see a lot of community service in your future. I'm practically a professional at doing community service. As a matter of fact, the Reese's Rhombus of Riches includes some people I've met while doing community service. And it is itself a community service since I'm providing a way for kids to get candy without the germs. I still think it sounds immoral. We're using candy that came from church. It's practically communion. How about we also give some candy to the less fortunate? You mean like kids who get their candy taken by bigger kids? Exactly. We'll give those kids the apples, raisins, and anything the vegan moms throw inside. Oh, you're so charitable. And I have some of those stickers from Vacation Bible School, so we'll put one of those on every bag of candy we distribute. That's advertising for God. I don't think God needs a pyramid scheme as a marketing plan. If the church needs a website and a Facebook page, I'm sure the Reese's Rhombus of Riches will be great advertising, and I'll try to recruit other Christian kids. Only Christians? Well, if you want to work the other religions as your territory, I'm happy to make you the regional manager for the mosques and synagogues. Just make sure the other religions allow Snickers. Billy, I don't want any part of this. I don't want all my friends trying to hide when they see me coming. I don't want my friends losing trust in me. Come to think of it, I have seen a lot of my friends running out of the park right when I get there, and the pastor's kid won't return my texts anymore. People don't want to be involved in schemes, whether you call them a pyramid, a Ponzi, or a magical rainbow of Skittles. And I'm pretty sure God's not thrilled with you telling people Jesus is your spokesman. I guess you're right. I do have another idea I'd love to share with you. Let me grab my brochures. My new idea is the Pentagon of Pepperoni Pizza. Beatty? Beatty, where'd you go? Oh, I get it. Fine. I'll just eat all the pizza by myself. And I have that whole bag of church candy, so I should probably start with a layer of Pepto Bismol. Oh, yeah? Well, me and the Lord, we got an understanding. We're on a mission from God. Putting the band back together. Forget it. No way. We're not.
We're on a mission from God. Matt, me and Elwood putting the band back together. Ma'am, you got to understand that this is a lot bigger than any domestic problems you might be experiencing. Would it make you feel any better if you knew that what we're asking Matt here to do is a holy thing? You see, we're on a mission from God. First you trade the Cadillac for a microphone. Then you lie to me about the band. Now you're gonna put me right back in the joint. They're not gonna catch us. We're on a mission from God. and six miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Yep. Today's scripture is a letter that Paul wrote to his friend Timothy. Now, Timothy was this young man that Paul met when he was out preaching and starting churches. They traveled together some until Paul got thrown in jail for being a Christian. Now, Timothy was from the town of Lystra, which was a little farming town. It was small then, and there's not even a town there anymore. It's in modern-day Turkey. Well, this church at Ephesus, the one from the book of Ephesians, they continued to have conflict. Paul sent Timothy there to try to lead them in a better direction. My wife once served a church that wasn't even in a town. There was a crossroads nearby with several houses. It was in Wisconsin, and they didn't even have a tavern. There was a young man in her church who was still in high school who felt called to ministry, so she had him help with worship and visit sick people and the elderly. She mentored him, and he's now a pastor. He started out serving small churches in small towns like the one he grew up in, but last year he got sent to a church in Milwaukee. Now he's doing great, but it got me thinking about the similarities. A really young person who grew up in the country and then suddenly was the pastor of a church in a big city. Now Ephesus was a huge metropolitan city with people from all different cultures. At the time, it was one of the most important cities in the world with a big port and lots of trade routes, philosophers, and this large and growing new church. He needed some advice in order to handle this problem. The church had people problems. There were powerful people in the church, people who were used to being a big deal in politics or in their jobs and businesses. They were used to getting their way. So people were trying to control the church like they controlled things at work. Some of them were trying to use their Christian faith to control people by saying that God told them to do it. Paul wrote this letter to give instructions on how to deal with that. You know, you have to pay attention when people say they're doing something in God's name because it's not always true. God is a great celebrity endorsement. People are way more likely to follow if they believe God is on your side. The Blues Brothers dropped everything for a mission from God. Missions from God are pretty great. There have been times in my life where I was certain that God was calling me to do something. I've been called to help orphans who need a family, to take people on mission trips so they experience the world in a new way and get to serve God to lead a church in a new direction, to help a church in conflict. It feels good to be a part of something that's important, that accomplishes something for God. But some people use God to get power, 
to con people out of money. When someone says that they're on a mission from God, it's hard to know what to believe. On the one hand, we really want to believe people. We want to be close to a mission from God. On the other hand, hearing voices from God is a common sign of mental illness. And unfortunately, we've seen so many politicians, dictators, and villains claiming that God told them to do things. You know, Adolf Hitler had the support and cooperation of a lot of church leaders because he said he was doing things for God. It's how cults get started, including cults that end in tragedy. The terrorists who led the 9-11 attacks claimed they were on a mission from God. The leaders of ISIS said they were on a mission from God in Syria and Iraq and used it as a cover to gain power and to steal things, killing and harming hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Insiders in the organization who left say that the leaders of ISIS don't even participate in the most basic religious rituals and prayers. They're just thieves. Happens a lot in the world, unfortunately, that people say they're on a mission from God when really they're just being selfish. Paul's letter helps us clear things up a little bit. In one verse, he basically says it's all about love. Love that isn't tainted by selfishness or self-interest of any kind. If somebody's telling you God told them to do something or say something, and they're making a big profit from it, that's a bad sign. If they're trying to elevate their power, that's a bad sign. If they haven't shown love of God and love for others in the past and don't seem to be showing love now, that's a really bad sign. If they don't obey God in other ways, it's a pretty bad sign that they're not really on a mission from God. Well, there's not a clear test for whether someone is truly on a mission from God. None of us are perfect. A former criminal could be on a mission from God, and the mission might even have some flaws. He might make mistakes. There are numerous times in the Bible where we learn about somebody who did something bad and was later called by God. David was the greatest king of God's people, but he did all kinds of things wrong. Moses killed a man in anger. Now, you could argue that there was some justification, but he killed someone and then hid from justice when he was a young man. Later on, he was sent on a huge mission from God to lead the people out of slavery to the promised land. He delivered the law. Moses was so important, the movie is four hours long, and they got Charlton Heston to play him. In the same way that a former criminal could be doing something good, Somebody who seems really good can say they're on a mission from God and be doing something bad. They might even believe in it themselves. One of my jobs is to help you see what God wants you to do, to find your own mission from God. And it's my job to ask you to help with missions of, of, from God that our church is called to carry out. But today's scripture warns us to be cautious about people who claim to be leading you on a mission that's really about helping them and not serving God. The problem with these kind of false prophets is they can be hard to detect. For one thing, they usually tell a lot of truth. Every good lie starts with a dose of truth. If you say something true and then repeat the, the lie many times while mixing in some more true things, eventually it's pretty hard not to believe the lie. The other problem comes from, well, the Red Riding Hood story, the wolf who dressed like grandma. People who falsely use God to get you to follow often look like good people and do things to help them seem like good people. They hide the bad. They keep secrets and do whatever it takes to keep the wolfishness hidden. 
Unfortunately, the, the world has a lot of wolves. They might claim they're a Nigerian prince. They might work for a website that makes fake news in Russia. They might claim to have your best interests at heart, even that they're on a mission from God. Remember, if you can see sharp teeth, big ears, or a grandma's bonnet that doesn't seem to fit, you might need to walk away. God will have a mission for you, a real mission. I actually share something in common with Jake and Elwood Blues. One time, I had a mission from God to play guitar in a blues band for a night. I didn't wear sunglasses or a hat or a skinny tie, but it was a lot of fun. Whether it's playing the blues, caring for a neighbor, caring for a child, preaching the word of God, or some other fantastic thing that God calls you to, I pray that everyone gets to experience a mission from God. Amen. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching in the marching, we are marching in the We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the marching, we are marching. We are singing in the light of God. 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 this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen, amen.